Okay, let's talk about the oxymercuration of alkenes using mercuric acetate and water. So if you take an alkene and you add mercuric acetate with water followed by sodium borohydride, the product from this reaction is an alcohol. You look at the key bonds that are formed and broken in this reaction, we're forming a carbon-oxygen bond, we're also forming a carbon-hydrogen bond, we're breaking a carbon-carbon pi bond, and we're also breaking a hydrogen-oxygen bond. So because we're breaking a carbon-carbon pi bond and we're forming carbon-oxygen and carbon-hydrogen, this follows into the category of an addition reaction. The large number of addition reactions in org 1, this is one of many. This particular pattern of addition is what we call Markovnikov addition. If you look at this alkene, on the left-hand side of this alkene, it's attached to a carbon atom, which is a generic R group here. And on the right-hand side of this alkene, it's attached to two hydrogen atoms. In the product that we obtain, the carbon that's attached to the most number of carbons ends up attached to the alcohol, the OH, and the carbon with the fewest number of carbons attached, so most hydrogens, ends up with the hydrogen. Again, this is called Markovnikov selectivity. Now, as you can see, besides the bonds that are formed and broken here, there's a lot of other bonds that are formed and broken uh, in this that I've sort of shown the byproducts in gray. So there's a lot more going on here than, than just what we've shown. Um, this comes up with the second step, the uh, addition of sodium borohydride, and we'll, sh we'll see how that works in a minute. Okay, so let's look at this first example, which is fairly straightforward take an alkene, we look at the alkene pattern. On the left-hand side, there's one carbon atom. On the right-hand side, there's two hydrogens, so no carbon atoms. The left-hand end of the alkene is more substituted. That means when we do the oxymercuration reaction, this end of the carbon of the double bond is going to be attached to the oxygen, and the end on the right is going to end up attached to the hydrogen. Okay. Similar example. Here we have a tri-substituted alkene. So if you look on the left-hand side of this alkene, we've got two carbon atoms. On the right-hand side of this alkene, we've got one carbon atom. Uh, so when we do the oxymercuration reaction, this is the most substituted end. So the left-hand side is the most substituted end. It's going to end up bonded to the oxygen. The carbon on the right-hand side is bounded to the fewest number of carbons, so it's going to end up bonded to the hydrogen. Lastly, we have an example of an alkene which has two carbons attached. If you look on the left-hand side of this alkene, it's attached to one carbon. And if you look on the right-hand side of this alkene, it's attached to one carbon. So both sides of this alkene are equally substituted. In a case like this, we can't really apply Markovnikov's rule because Markovnikov's rule says we have to add to the more substituted end, and they're equally substituted here. So in this case, we're going to end up with a mixture of two alcohols, one on the left-hand side of the alkene and one on the right-hand side of the alkene. Now, one thing I haven't really mentioned here uh, is that the NaBH4 at the end is for the purpose of removing the mercury. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we talk about the mechanism. So going into the mechanism of this reaction, it's a little bit difficult to show with curved arrows uh, due to the limitations of them forming, moving two electrons at once, but we'll do our best here. Starting with an alkene, which is our nucleophile in this reaction, we are going to add to mercuric acetate, which is our electrophile. So the pair of electrons travels from the pi bond between carbon 1 and carbon 2, moves towards mercury, and we displace an acetate ion from mercury to form this three-membered ring here. This is called the mercurinium ion. You notice mercury has three things attached to it. That's going to give it a positive charge. Uh, and the carbon 1 and carbon 2, both of them are attached to the mercury. So we're forming a three-membered ring here. In the next step, arrow C, water comes in. A lone pair from water will attack carbon 1 on the opposite side of the carbon-mercury bond. So it's attacking from the back side uh, of the carbon-mercury bond. Now note that it's attacking the more substituted carbon atom. It's attacking the more substituted carbon atom because this carbon atom is the carbon that's best able to stabilize positive charge. And therefore, if it's best able to stabilize positive charge, there's going to have a higher charge density on that carbon, and it's going to be more electrophilic, so it's going to seek out electrons more, and therefore it's going to be the most reactive carbon. So water attacks carbon-1. We break the mercury-carbon bond. That's arrow D. Um, and we're going to end up forming 
the carbon oxygen bond and we're gonna still have one carbon mercury bond. So notice we're breaking carbon one to mercury but we're still keeping carbon two to mercury. That's, that's still there. In the next step, the water that we've added is now the oxygen has a positive charge, a formal charge of plus one. We have a counter ion of acetate floating around in solution. This is perfectly acceptable to use as our base. We can use the acetate ion to remove a proton from the oxygen. So arrow E here is showing the formation of oxygen to hydrogen. And we're going to show the breakage of oxygen hydrogen with arrow F. This ends up with being uh, having a neutral OH and the mercury attached to the oxygen. We're also forming one equivalent of acetic acid, HOAC. Now, the last step here is usually just written as a magic step. The mechanism is generally not given. But if you add NABH4, the product uh, ends up, you end up replacing, breaking the carbon mercury bond and you form a carbon hydrogen bond. So it's almost as if the mercury was never there. Uh, and another thing to note is that since the oxygen is attacking the backside from mercury, we might expect the oxygen and mercury to have an anti-relationship to each other. And in fact, they do. But we don't talk about that in this reaction because this last step uh, using sodium borohydride goes through a free radical and actually destroys the stereochemistry on carbon-2 here. So uh, it's a dirty little secret that no one really talks about. Real quickly, just wanted to go into that mechanism because even though it's not in textbooks, it's good to just sort of know what's going on so it's not some big mystery. It's um, simply you take sodium borohydride and what you're gonna do is you're gonna add hydrogen to the mercury. This is gonna displace the acetate ion. So you're gonna form this mercury hydride. Now, this is a weird step, but what's happening is this carbon mercury bonds are very weak and this will undergo what we call homolytic cleavage. So the carbon mercury bond will displace, will break so that you have one electron on the carbon and one electron on the mercury. Uh, so now this is mercury one. Um, followed by that, uh, you the hydrogen from the mercury then adds to the carbon free radical and you end up forming the alkane and uh, solid mercury. Actually, I shouldn't say solid mercury. Uh, Dave reminded me it's actually liquid mercury, right? So I always forget that exception. That is the hydro, the, that is the oxymercuration of alkenes using water and mercuric acid, and it's a pretty standard addition reaction for Org 1. Thanks for listening.